Hello and good good evening. Uh, welcome to this room. Sorry for being late. It's not really easy to organize this conference uh, in uh, such a short time, but it was a collaborative effort of the Arduino community. We are very happy to make the to make this happen. And uh, we are very happy to have all of you here. So uh, this track is about uh, Arduino based medical devices, which are not ventilators. If you're interested in ventilators, you can join room one. You will find the YouTube link on the conference page. While in this uh, Zoom room, we are going to talk about all the other kind of devices which are potentially useful for combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we know that uh, ventilators are a very important device. We also know that uh, the medical community and, uh, and other communities need uh, so many other devices and uh, potentially they might also need something that uh, hasn't invented yet. So we, we got a number of applications in the past few days and speakers are in this room. So I would like to uh, start quickly so that we don't waste our time. And uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, the first speaker to uh, present uh, uh, their project, uh, Yusufa Mohamadou. Uh, I will give you the ability to uh, to talk. Yusufa Mohamadou uh, from Cameroon. The project is about uh, the design of an oxygen concentrator based on uh, Arduino. Uh, Uh, Yusufa. Uh, okay, let's uh, try with another speaker. Um, uh, Rohit Sharma, are you there? Rohit Sharma from the United States. Yes. Can you well, hear me? Yeah, we can hear very well. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so let me share the uh, PowerPoint quickly. And I have five minutes, I assume. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. So my name is Rohit Sharma, and I work for AITS. Um, and our project is um, Arduino AI toolchain. What we offer is uh, software and setup algorithms that make it easy for your for your AI algorithms to quickly deploy on Arduino devices. Um, and in in the times of need, we are offering our services for free for anybody who needs. We are ready to join hands on COVID nineteen apps. We are looking to collaborate with you if you have an idea with passion. Be it a doctor, an academician, a professional, a company, researcher, or an innovator. We will provide all the softwares, access to our data scientists, embedded professionals, guidance on firmware, hardware, and technology, and ongoing help in the development and debugging of the application. Please, please do join hand with us. We are looking um, to, to, uh, to help you develop your application. So how is our platform um, uh, you know, helps you? Uh, one of the ideas, um, you know, COVID ideas is uh, ventilator components. You can use AI to build flow analyzer, ventilator testers, monitors, and so on and so forth. And the ideas have to come from you. We would provide all the help, the data that you would need, the software that is required, and everything to help you build the entire application. And so in, in detail, what do we provide? We, you, you, we help you with picking up the software. We do supply software set up we let you um we would help you with acquiring the data train the model develop the application compile the application and flash the application and also monitor the devices everything around arduino is is our expertise we've been working in this area for years and just to give you an give you an idea what we have done in the past we, we did partner with arm to develop this simple application the simple application that helps mute population um, uh, I'm not sure if you would be able to hear the sound on this video, but let's take a look. 
No, we, we can't hear the sound. Okay, uh, so it was a simple idea where you, by embedding sensors on your fingertips, the ASL language can be decoded into words with NLP uh, as an AI model and you can, and a mute person with speech impairment can talk to the rest of the world. Um, and that enables 70 million um, population worldwide. It's just one of the ideas that has helped the world and we are continuously work, working with our partners um, if you want to find more about AI toolset, here is the link, and we do provide DNN compiler and Arduino as an open source. So you, if you if you are if you are an expert in that domain, you don't need our help. You can go ahead and use that. If you do need our help, do come back to us. We are also integrated in Arduino IDE. Uh, if you search for DeepC, you will find our library right there. And we have a number of distinguished features that make us unique uh, at this time of the need to use AI and ML in se several of your projects. So please do use us. And again, I would, I would reiterate, um, uh, join hands on COVID-19 apps. We are looking to collaborate with you with an idea and passion. We will provide all the software access to our employees, data scientists and embedded professionals. We will provide guidance on firmware, hardware and technology. And we will also help you in the development and debugging of application. Please do join hands with us. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, um, so among the panelists, we also have uh, uh, Ravit Sharma. Uh, you, you both have the same last name. Are you working together somehow or is it just a coincidence? No, we are not working together. Oh, okay, okay. Then, uh, uh, then thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, of course, uh, keep... Uh, an eye on the chat as um, people are asking questions and also I remind to all the attendees that uh, they can ask questions in the chat in the in Zoom room or also in the Discord channel. If you join the Arduino Discord space, there is a COVID-19 channel where uh, discussion is taking place uh, and uh, we will also uh, read the most interesting questions and uh, ask them to, to the speakers during, during this track and during the next one. Uh, so, uh, thank you, thank you again. Uh, I, I would like to invite uh, then uh, uh, Ravit Sharma, Ravit Sharma also from the United States. Uh, let me just uh, uh, give a voice to him. Hi, there's the sound coming. Welcome, Ravit. Hi. Um, so you submitted uh, an, an application about a project uh, entitled uh, uh, called First Level Cough Sound Screening for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, t tell us what it's about. Yeah, we can see so, you're sharing your screen. All right, all right. So I'll just get started here. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, like Alessandro just mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, COSPECT, a first level screening for COVID-19. Um, so what is, what is the motivation behind this? Sort of a symptom, anal uh, symptom analyzer, something that can um, take your cough sound or breathing sound and provide symptom analysis, as well as an individualized recommendation. Um, motivated by the lack of doctors, you know, um, the, they're becoming uh, more full by the moment as uh, cases spike nearly a million across the globe. And so we're sort of working as a first level screening that can help the public identify their symptoms in advance, as well as get individualized recommendation for how they should follow up. So the functionality is that it's a lightweight neural network that's uh, going to be running on an Arduino edge device. Uh, and that can generate um, real-time predictions. I, I'm sorry, Ravit, I, I, can, I can't actually see the screen you're sharing. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's stuck on the, on the loading uh, black screen. So maybe you can try to, to, yeah, to stop sharing and start it again. Okay. Um... Uh, it's loading. I will tell you when we can see it. All right. Yeah, also other people are commenting that they were not able to see it. No, it's still stuck on the black screen. Um, I, I suggest you, you don't go in full screen mode. 
uh, with your presentation and you just share your uh, presentation software window directly without going full screen. Okay. Um... Is that better? Or... No, we still see a black screen. Share your slides. Here, uh, I can go ahead and share the slides uh, on the chat. Maybe okay, perfect. Right. If you share the slides, uh, I, I can try to share them myself while while you you speak. So please, right. go on. Okay, okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So I'm on the third slide here. Uh, the functionality is a lightweight neural network um, that we are gonna run on the edge device. If we have sort of, um, you know, something that can generate real time predictions as to what do you have? Do you have a dry cough versus wet cough uh, present in 60% of cases? Uh, do you have shortness, shortness of breath present in 20% of cases? And sort of the idea is that it would help out uh, patients identify what symptoms they have if they're not able to access doctors and provide recommendations. So uh, three big advantages of this solution. First of all, and the biggest one is that it is non-intrusive because it's automated and all, there's no chance of um, you know, transmission of the infection via doctors or person-to-person uh, -person contact. Second, it's scalable. So unlike uh, medical professionals, which are limited in their number, um, you know, there are only a finite number of doctors and uh, at the moment too, they're also very busy. Uh, this is a scalable solution. All you need, all you really need, is a microcontroller that can run this edge technology. And number three, number three, it's versatile. It can be placed in a variety of settings, uh, whether it be individual testing or simply running in the background at a public facility, for example. So, what is our status? Uh, we have our neural network uh, getting it running on the Arduino Edge device so that it can, um, you know, make real-time edge predictions. Uh, second, we've developed a simple web app for COSPEC diagnosis, something that can, you know, just let you upload the files, um, upload files of you coughing or the breathing sound and provide analysis on your variety of symptoms and the recommendation, your risk level, so on. Um, and number three, we're reaching out to public facilities, including airports and hospitals. Slide six, I have a video. I won't, um, you know, go through that right now, but please feel free to check it out. Uh, simply uh, our first version of the web app running um, uh, the analysis. Slide seven, our roadmap for the future development. Um, phase one would be the mobile slash web app, so the short term solution where we have sort of like in the web app, users can directly record their cough sound to get diagnostics. Uh, following that, moving to phase two local uh, and public facilities. If we can get this, um, you know, in up at local, um, for example, airports or subway stations where there's a high chance of transmission and identify um, the high risk individuals so they can self isolate. Uh, that's the second phase. And third phase is sort of upscaling, continuing to grow and expand into various facilities. All right, uh, slide eight, our next steps, uh, what we're working on right now is testing and refining our model. So we're gathering additional data as it continues to become available regarding COVID-19 symptoms um, and, you know, just incrementally uh, building upon it and um, expanding uh, its functionality. Uh, and second, we're hoping to be continuing to make this technology useful, uh, uh, as I mentioned, starting with the web app and uh, reaching out to local and public facilities. So what are we looking for? We're looking for, you know, uh, people across the board testers who can help us find data and uh, refine our model, developers who can help us improve our model, add more features, manufacturers who can help us, um, you know, upscale the edge devices, business people to help contracts with the public facilities, upscaling advisors, regulation advisors. So, you know, we're li really looking for anyone who's uh, interested in this cause. Um, we, we know this is a very proven technology. They've been papers for uh, you know, uh, several years, over a decade that can show um, that cough detection is a viable, um, you know, uh, is a viable source of uh, analysis for the symptoms. 
Um, and so now we're really looking to put this technology into test, um, in, into use. Um, we've been working on this for quite some time and um, just would like to uh, share this with the world and uh, reach out uh, to you all. Um, thank you for your time and here's the contact email. Thank you. Uh, thank you for for this presentation. So um, if uh, if uh, any any panelists, any speaker who submitted the project in the in these days uh, uh, is uh, in the in the chat and hasn't promoted and uh, who's not promoted to panelists, please raise your hand and we will uh, identify you in the list of attendees. Um, I would like to invite uh, uh, Yusufa Muhammadu, let's try again, uh, from Cameroon. Can you hear us? Um, uh, okay. Mm, hello? Hello and welcome. We can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And uh, I am uh, really glad to join you uh, this evening. So, um, yeah, so I need to share my screen, I think. Yeah, yes, please, share um, your screen. Meanwhile, okay. I, will, I will remind that your, your, your speech is about your project, which is an oxygen concentrator based on Arduino. Uh, yes, okay, so um, let me just give me a minute there to share the screen. Um, Oh, I am having. Yeah, now we can see oh. your face, but probably. Uh, but yeah, I. Can, you can see your face. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I'm still looking for a way to share the screen. Um, uh, there, there is a green button. Ah, uh, oh, it's the green button. Okay. Yeah, with share. Okay. Yes. Um. Yes. Okay. So I just need. So I will just. Uh, so, um, I guess we, we can see. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, okay. So, uh, maybe a little slight uh, modification in the title there. So, it is, uh, I will be talking about the local oxygen concentrator and uh, the analyzer system. Okay. So, um, of course, what brings us here is the COVID 19, which is raging around the world. And, uh, especially in the developed world, but we see more and more infections in the low content, in low in resource countries, especially in Africa. And the problem, I mean, in the developed world, what we usually see is like they, they, they have a lack, uh, they lack a lot of, a lot, lack of ventilations. So, um, so the, there is this call, like this one to like, uh, I mean, they are calls to produce or must produce ventilators. Uh, which would be used with uh, oxygen concentrators uh, in order to service the patient. But the problem that we have, especially in Africa here, is that we don't even have those uh, oxygen concentrators. Mm -hmm. Like in Cameroon here, where I am, uh, we the oxygen are delivered in, in, te in terms of tanks in hospitals. And uh, just recently, the head of a general hospital in our capital city, he said that um, for each patient, they had to use about uh, at least three cans of oxygen uh, each each uh, each day, and which cost roughly about uh, uh, about around five hundred dollars. Okay, and five hundred dollars for a country like Cameroon, which is poor, is a little bit much. So uh, hence uh, this uh, project that we have been working for uh, sometimes uh, ago, which is the, the oxygen concentrator. So the basic functioning of this oxygen concentrator is uh, just this is a simplified diagram where we have cylinders which contain the nitrate filter cylinder, which, uh, which is which also known as uh, zeolite, which uh, filters out uh, other gases leaving the oxygen. So connected, in, uh, as you can see here on the left, with um, a series of valves. So, and the, the compressor, which uh, drives in, which sucks in air and passes it to the cylinders, and then it is stored in the reservoir. And we also have uh, oxygen level indicator. So the, the operation of this valve is uh, shown in the, with, according to the diagram shown uh, on the right of uh, your screen. So we used, um, in the uh, in the prototype that we developed, we use an oxygen sensor from uh, 
uh, from Germany that we bought, which uh, sends us the oxygen, and then we take the signal, filter it, and then passes it through um, an Arduino Mega that we use in order to control the system and uh, to display the results. So what we can see here is, uh, so we have uh, a series of, uh, there is an equation that uh, got wiped out. I don't know why, but uh, so we measure certain values in terms of universe and then we uh, convert them into oxygen concentration. So um, this slide shows um, the, the overview of uh, the system that we did that was developed based on uh, Arduino uh, Mega. You can see the board on the left hand side and then the LCD, I mean the, the display is showing the level of uh, oxygen with operation. And uh, with this uh, system that we developed, we were able to extract oxygen between, uh, I mean, up to around uh, 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 82%, from 82% up to 98% which is uh, quite good. And uh, also we can see, so this is, as you can see here, it's just something which is rudimentarily made with, with, uh, with just uh, materials or things that we can find here. So the important thing is this, uh, to produce this type of, uh, this type of system, uh, I mean, in a week, we can produce around three, right? three uh, components which will go a long way in helping, uh, in helping people or uh, sick people in them uh, in this time of um, uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, and uh, the problem, as I said, is we have we lack a lot of resources. We see uh, like the sensors we need to buy them either from Germany or from uh, China, and uh, so uh, we are calling. We are trying to work. We are trying to get in contact with our government and other government and also NGOs to fund this project so that we can disseminate. Uh, the idea all throughout Africa and other developing countries. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yusufa. This this is a very very interesting project. So, uh, I'm, I'm very I'm very happy that you were able to present this to us. Uh, I, um, I have a, a few questions for you, yes, and also yes. I, I would like to invite uh, everyone to uh, ask their questions in the in the chat as we uh, have um, quite some time, so we have time to discuss with our speakers. Uh, uh, and understand their projects better. Uh, in, in this case, uh, um, uh, for, first off, I would like to to understand uh, how um, uh, did you validate this uh, this project? Uh, uh, did you involve uh, doctors in your team? Oh. Uh, are you running tests uh, in a, in a oh. clinical environment? Mm -hmm. um, yes, we we uh, we worked with uh, doctors because I am. Uh, working at the university hospital where I am. So in the development, we uh, worked with uh, doctors in order at least to, to validate the, before it was supposed to be used because uh, we had to um, we had to test the, uh, before it was being used, we had to take a sample of the oxygen that was uh, the, uh, concentrated and then test it in a, in a well, in a laboratory. I mean, to evaluate, really evaluate that concentration. And it is based on that that we calibrated uh, our system to give that concentration of that. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, is there any other question? I don't know. Sorry, I was in mute. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, I see Muhammad in the chat is asking uh, you to share your contact information. Uh, uh, okay. As uh, I, I think that your project. Uh, can be interesting for 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 a few other people. So, if you can mm -hmm. share your contact information either in the chat or okay in the presentation. Also, uh, are you going to share this presentation as well? Other people are uh, asking for this. Um, yes, I can. I can or or maybe it. a link to a website or some place where mm -hmm. you're publishing. Uh, uh, the okay, I think I, I will I will I will share it in the Google Drive and then I can. Great. Uh, uh, so I would like to understand also, uh, are you in touch with other um, uh, hospitals or countries uh, which need this kind of devices? Are you collaborating with, uh, with other people? Um, yeah, in terms of collaboration, uh, yeah, I contacted some of uh, my colleagues, biomedical engineers in certain countries like uh, in Uganda, uh, Kenya. Okay. But they did not uh, get back uh, to me. 
Um, also in Bangladesh, I think I contacted uh, on a professor that I have been working with. Okay, so um, they were also all intrigued by the idea. But as I said, the problem is um, they could reproduce it there, but uh, they are also looking for resources in order to, to do that. So the main problem, as I said, is really the, the resource. I see. Mm. Uh, Geoffrey is asking, with this device, how ma many patients can be provided with oxygen at the same time? Mm, okay, for uh, we did not evaluate in terms of number of patients that can be evaluated, but the prototype you see here contains around it can it can, it can concentrate up to ten liters of uh, oxygen. So maybe based on that, we can imagine how much uh, maybe each person uh, each person can use or how many uh, patients can be served with one of these devices. Um, I, I have a couple more, more questions. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you lack resources, uh, so you, you can produce three of these devices every week. Um, I, I guess you are referring to financial resources to, yes. to buy the components, or there is also a problem with sourcing and shipping the components? Mm, yeah, that, th those are the two actually. So the first thing is like the financial resources and also like, uh, as I said, if you have to buy the components, you have to get them either from, from Europe or from China mostly. So, uh, and especially in this time where all the, uh, I mean, the, the, the airports are, are closed, so you might also face some difficulties in that. So those are the main uh, issues. But, you know, uh, okay, I have one one final question. Uh, as as far as you can see, um, uh, do you think that the the COVID nineteen pandemic will increase demand for these kind of devices in uh, in African countries, especially? Uh, yes, of course. As I said before, um, like uh, the the first the, the the number of cases you can see are increasing. First of all, is we did not even have a means to test them. That is why I guess the numbers were low. But with the arrival of the testing kit that was donated by uh, Alibaba's Jack Ma, so a lot of testing has been done. And it's in each day, in each, like, each day in each country, you have like uh, more than tens of uh, cases that are being uh, di diagnosed, and more, more and more of those patients will need. Uh, uh, oxygen, uh, how can I say, tape therapy, or <laughs> I mean, they might use to use uh, the, the, this device. So I guess uh, as time goes by in a few weeks or months, we might really see this device will be very, very uh, helpful in uh, managing this crisis that we are facing. Okay, so I think that uh, your presentation in this conference uh, could be useful uh, in order to create uh, connections uh, with, with other people who might uh, join efforts with you, or, with you and, uh, and, uh, and make this scale. Um, uh, okay, I okay, see uh, more questions. There is a question from, from Luca Toldo, who is uh, the next speaker. Uh, he's asking, how did you address the problem of energy mm -hmm. storage? Um, energy storage in terms of the like uh, the power power supply of the system, or I mean, if it is in terms of power for now, it's uh, we use the main power, it's plugged in, and then it works. But um, in future, it was I mean, back when we developed this device, in future we were thinking of using uh, uh, like alternate uh, power supplies like uh, like uh, solar panels. Or solar power, or and uh, to in order to to service this uh, equipment. Okay. I hope that. Uh, that's... Okay. Thank you. I I, I would like to um, to invite actually to invite uh, Luca, the next speaker, as he has a few questions for you. So I I think it's nice to to create a, a connection uh, uh, in a deepening on on this topic. But first, I would like to invite Massimo Banzi, co-founder okay. of our. Hi. Please. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Hello. Yusufa, congratulations for your project. It's very nice. So, okay, thank you, Massimino. So, if you send us an email with your details, we will ship you some boards. 
Okay, thank you. Helping you accelerate this. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. And may I say that it is an honor to speak to you. Uh, I am uh, very, I am really uh, grateful for your support. Okay. And, uh, Don't worry, it's our okay. pleasure. We are grateful that you use the Arduino to build something that's so useful for people. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Luca, Luca Toldo, welcome. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, of course. So if you have a, a few questions for, for Yusufa before you start with your presentation, you know, we can just uh, steal a couple of minutes from, from the schedule. And, uh, sure, so Yusufa, it's a very interesting presentation. I've been using uh, with patients the oxygen okay. concentration um, for particularly for COPD um, okay. patients. Mm -hmm. So uh, that seems to be, for me, it's an interesting use case. Certainly devices like your one uh, cost quite, uh, are quite expensive also here in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, the main problem is, um, and their use case, as I said, is COPD. So uh, patients which are mobile, they can walk around, they don't stay in bed, and, um, mm -hmm. and therefore portability is an essential, uh, it's, it's a must have. I was wondering, yes. are you using a pump, electric pump, to pump uh, the oxygen through the, through the, to pump the air, right? Yes, yes, we have an electric pump. Like how, did you resolve, how did you resolve the problem of the noise which the pump generates? Because uh, among the COPD patients, that is a big problem. Yes, um, okay, that, that, is, uh, that is something that we did not, uh, we were not able to address at this point. Okay. What what we what we, we did was uh, to try to insulate it in a in a cushion, such okay. that uh, maybe to dampen a little bit of those noise. But uh, okay. it was not that uh, good. But okay, hello. But um, in our in our research, I mean, we were thinking that maybe we could find a, another a pump or a compressor that could produce this. I began to compress the air without much of uh, this noise. The other problem is the kind of compression which you use uh, and uh, did you measure if the compressed air had any kind of, uh, of, um, of um, particles or you know with, with, according to the compression system there can be oil or any or the membrane which is doing the, the compressions which mm -hmm. could then uh, uh, damage the air. Did you do analysis of the air after the compression? Mm, okay, the analysis that was done was uh, mostly to find the, con uh, the concentration of uh, the air, but uh, and it's just that we did not think about uh, this, and I think that is something that I need to maybe we need to work with the especially with the uh, microbiologists that we are working who tested the air in the laboratory. Yeah, the gas gas chromatography and all these kind of techniques in order. Yes, exactly. To the, you need exactly. to do PC in order to check that the, the quality of the air. Is, mm -hmm. uh, is sufficient. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah these were mm -hmm. the main, uh, so it's a very valuable for single patients, COPD, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which means mobile patient, not uh, restricted to a bed, which mm -hmm. means uh, it's, it's very valuable. It's heavily used here in Germany, devices like that. Mm -hmm. They are usually have also a smaller volume. So if mm -hmm. you look for a smaller volume, you, this could also be another target for your use case. Okay. Smaller volume means uh, mm -hmm. uh, easier to transport and uh, mm -hmm. wider usability. Okay. 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 Yeah. Very uh, nice thank, you. thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. So again, again. Are you going to share the drawings? Uh, what, what? Are you going to share the drawings and all these things? Are you yeah, yes, I'm going to share the, 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 first of all, I'm going to share the PowerPoints and then I uh, will try to collect all the design files that we use yeah. to, to share it with you. Very good, thank you. you thank you again, Yusuf. I'll also share your contacts. Uh, yes. so, uh, mm -hmm. Welcome, Luca. Also, thank you for, for helping us uh, discuss the, mm -hmm. this project. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you submitted uh, quite a, a different uh, yeah, uh, project about a very different issue related to right. yeah intensive yeah. care. So go um, on. here in here uh, in Germany. Oh, sorry, I am having a small problem with uh, with the sharing, but I know how to fix it. So here in Germany, uh, so a big problem is uh, managing or role in Europe the availability 
of uh, of, uh, of screens uh, of, of sorry the availability of uh, resources of beds or whatever resources um, in uh, uh, across uh, across the country particularly in intensive care unit um, intensive care unit beds which are very complex devices they um, are um, um, they are uh, relatively few and uh, um, and uh, they um, they cannot uh, so they, they are very they are relatively few and uh, they are fairly expensive and therefore it's a, it's a, it's a difficult to um, to access them so it's some a big problem which is uh, here in Europe is uh, to know where can I go when I need an intensive care unit where can I go where where is an available uh, uh, such a such a such a thing and uh, so that was uh, the reason why. Um, uh, two weeks ago, together with my son, um, uh, I came up with the, the with the idea of uh, um, of uh, um, addressing this need uh, with a very a very very simple idea. I mean, everybody has a um, uh, know about uh, um, knows about uh, um, the dash, so the buttons by which you can uh, order uh, things, and. Um, and unfortunately, I'm having a problem with uh, with Zoom and not showing my screen. So um, if, if you can share your presentation, I can uh, share it for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy. So ah, I can mail it to you, right? Yeah. But um, um, and um, the um, and so what we did, uh, we simply uh, um, well, maybe I can show my. Can you see my? I can try to show my my camera. Can you see my screen? Oh yes, you can see me. So we built this device. And uh, and with this device, it's simply uh, um, there is an ESP there, a Node MCU ESP, and um, uh, if you could uh, share the, the I mean I'm, I'm sorry, and then there is a very simple button, and with this button uh, here, uh, yeah, um, you can uh, in this moment this device has sent uh, a fast uh, um, healthcare information. Uh, message to a central database that uh, the device uh, was in a status active and uh, this uh, this information can be seen on the web immediately and therefore immediately it's codified according to international standard for healthcare interoperability and uh, and there you can monitor the status of which resources are available and uh, this simple ideas address all the problem of the of identifying where are uh, available ICUs, intensive care units, uh, beds, or any kind of, of resources which one needs to have. Um, uh, the the video uh, I've I put up a video in a YouTube. I've shared with you the the YouTube uh, uh, link, uh, uh, Alessandro. If you could uh, if you pu could uh, put that up on your screen, that would be easier. And um, and uh, so this uh, as I said, this idea is consists of a simple. Um, so meanwhile, my my son made even a smaller 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 devices uh, where the node MCU is on the back and uh, and and uh, what is what is sorry it's on the back and what is uh, what is also cool is that this device it's also uh, implementing a, a cryptographic uh, digital signature which means uh, uh, this uh, this uh, thanks to the Arduino software uh, environment which you kindly provided for free then this device also digitally signs with the RSA cryptography the message which is then published on the on the on the public uh, database for fast air care interoperability resources and uh, and there uh, nobody can tap it because uh, the power of uh, of uh, this small device um, attached to it the easiness of uh, of programming uh, thanks to the Arduino exactly so this is a this is a video if you can Started. This is a called fire EHR button. The uh, fire it means first are killed interoperability. Everybody can have a look on it. And here I will. I, it's a de it's a true de live demonstration on how one can uh, um, operate the device. And then if you scroll a bit uh, faster, then you can um, see basically. So in the back in the screen there you can see the status of the database. The database is a public database uh, of uh, uh, according to the. FHIR, which is a standard uh, for healthcare interoperability, and um, and uh, that's it basically. So um, uh, we did this, uh, in, and I did it as a, I mean, I'm I'm in a software company, 
but I did this in my free time uh, together with my son, which is a computer uh, scientist uh, student. And then uh, um, basically this address the needs of, uh, of uh, identifying quickly, easily, and, um, and uh, online there is in the GitHub repository also all the source code, the electronic, the drawings. Uh, meanwhile, my son made a, a new, new design. <laughs> And uh, um, yes, so this also shows that uh, you can do digital signature in uh, using a simple ESP um, 12 F like like this one, uh, and um, and this that, that's basically that's it. Um, this project has been uh, um, presented to the German hackathon. Um, the device it is using Wi-Fi, um, but. Um, uh, it has been presented at a German hackathon organized by the German government and uh, exactly this one. And uh, at this uh, page, uh, you will see uh, all uh, uh, the lessons learned from the approach, uh, various drawings, uh, um, the cryptographic aspect, uh, and uh, it's on devpost.com. And I'm really sorry for the screen sharing, which now didn't work due to, um, due to some uh, problem with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Zoomas and the security of Apple, um, and being the first time that I use uh, Zoomas Thank on this Mac. So Thank you, you Luca. That's, that's it. Um, uh, I have a question. So you presented this to a hackathon. Um, yeah. Did you get any feedback uh, from, yes. the uh, from the, the medical authorities? I mean, yeah, there I, is demand, demand or potential demand for these devices. Right. So there is demand in China. For example, I have uh, uh, colleagues in China. They explain me that they collected the status of the device of the of the available bed by hand on paper, and then it's a very tedious and non-scalable process. Obviously, this uh, easy device, uh, which basically consists of a Node MCU or equivalent. I mean, I simply use Node MCU because I got. Uh, I'm. Uh, I love IoT and I love Arduino. And, and I had it lying around, uh, and uh, so that I use it. Um, and, uh, and I'm really amazed because you needed to do cryptography, you need to have a Wi-Fi, obviously, and, uh, and it doesn't work. You see there in this uh, screen shot, um, uh, the, the, the encoding of the digital signature down there, and it's all done extremely fast without uh, additional stuff. So yeah, there is a need, however, um, depends to the country which are looking into. For example, here in Germany, um, there are several thousand hospitals and all of them, they have a hospital information system. And the hospital information system, obviously it's a proprietary solution usually. And, uh, um, and it has already the kind of a tracking of the bed. So the, the issue of sharing where are the beds is more of a business aspect than of a technological aspect, yeah? And, um, the, however, um, this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this approach here um, with this uh, small device, uh, IoT uh, fire device, which is not a medical device because this is just a switch about availability of, of, of a resource and therefore does not need to get uh, um, uh, standardized according to medical device regulation, which can be extremely time consuming. I've been working 20 years in a pharmaceutical company in R&D and, and I know how regulations are very important, but obviously it takes time and a grassroots activity or quick things are take, they're needed. So such a device, as I said, can be used for uh, rapidly. For example, if you look at the emergency situation like are happening now in US or in Brazil, where thousands of beds are prepared, but they don't have certainly time to track each of those beds. Obviously one could use the, one could extend this mini device with a GPS tracker or other tracking of uh, other um, other uh, longitudinal, latitudinal tracking the uh, sensors in order to have an exact on the spot position where is the bed available. And I haven't yet done that because obviously in uh, uh, GPS we know it in a, inside a room, inside a building is not that good actually. And uh, but obviously thanks to the good library which I have in the Arduino uh, software development for Wi-Fi based uh, location tracking, that is also a possibility to add on. So long story short, with this, with this device here, we see IoT uh, done uh, addressing a real need in healthcare and uh, using the latest uh, standard for communication interoperability and cryptography all on a chip. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Also share your contacts as people might be interested in asking for more information and uh, 
um, collaborating with you. So uh, we have a Discord channel, COVID-19. We yeah. have the forum. We have the, the Arduino forum has a board dedicated to COVID-19 projects. So that might be, might be a good place to share Perfect. also the link to your design so that uh, we uh, foster some collaboration uh, within the community, which is the, the main purpose of, of this conference. Sure. And thank you uh, very much again to Arduino, uh, to the company and uh, congratulations to the inventors and thanks also for the great software which you are making available for free it's, it's really a, a power nuts it's really amazing thank you so much thank you thank you also for this uh, of course uh, please su support uh, arduino so that we can continue developing uh, free software for for everyone and uh, and foster the, the this ecosystem uh, so now let's uh, move on to a different topic i would like to invite uh, the next uh, panelist, uh, um, Nastaran Hashemi from Iran. I'll uh, just let me voice uh, uh, them. Nastaran. Hi, uh, I'm Nastaran Hashemi from Iran, and I'm here to present our Arduino project, which aims to combat uh, COVID 19. Uh, let me share my yeah. document. Welcome. Also, we, we all know that Iran is, is fighting COVID-19. Uh, uh, these yeah, are yeah, tough yeah. times in, in our country, so... Mm. Uh, I, can, I, uh, I can't... I uh, can't... I found it. Uh, you can see my presentation? Not yet. Mm. Okay, uh, no problem. I can't uh, say about my voice. <laughs> Or, or if you want uh, to share the know, link uh, to I've, the presentation or send it to me, I um, can share it while you're speaking, as you prefer. I, I think uh, the voice is uh, enough. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would start with a question that we all know the answer to. What happens to the body after contracting the coronavirus? As you know, uh, COVID-19 mainly affects lungs. Uh, this disease uh, is a respiratory disease, so the lungs are usually affected first. Uh, according to what doctors said, uh, what we are frequently seeing in patients who are uh, severely ill with COVID-19 is a condition that we uh, call uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. ARDS doesn't happen with just COVID-19. A number of events can trigger it, including infection, uh, trauma and sepsis. But the point is that all of the patients who have uh, COVID-19 have this condition. Uh, I want to uh, say what ADRDs do with the body. This condition uh, causes damage to the lungs, um, which uh, leads to fluid leaking from small blood vessels in the lung. So the oxygen saturation, I mean uh, the SO2 uh, percentage in um, one's lungs uh, would uh, be low, lower than the nor normal uh, situation. Uh, and this, uh, so this factor, I mean, uh, the blood oxygen level uh, can be used uh, for diagnosis, the ones who need to go to the doctor and, and they need to be checked. According to what WHO said, uh, a below normal oxygen level is under uh, 95. Uh, if yours is under 93, you are suspected to have coronavirus. And if it's under 90, you should visit doctor as soon as possible. So in this state, I should say that what our project is and how it can help the situation. Uh, we have made an impressively expensive pulse oximeter with uh, Arduino uh, platform. So what pulse oximeter this is? A pulse oximeter device uh, is a device that estimates the amount of oxygen in your blood. It does so by sending infrared light into capillaries in your fingers, toe, or other body parts. Then it measures how much light is, re is reflected of the ga gases. So uh, in this way, we can understand uh, the, blood, uh, the oxygen level of the blood and then uh, understanding if the person uh, is at the risk of uh, coronavirus or not. 
the, this device, I mean, uh, the pulse oximeter is available in the world. But the problem is that one, uh, it is expensive, and two, uh, they cannot uh, be used um, in the homes. And uh, if a person wants to check if he or she is at risk at uh, is at risk of corona, they should go to hospitals or uh, the places that uh, are for testing, uh, where is um, very polluted and um, the on that places, the risk of getting the virus is very high. And three, in some countries, for example, my country, Iran, we cannot import uh, even medical devices and these oximeters uh, because of the uh, sanctions against Iran. If you know about uh, the sanctions and uh, that uh, America has about uh, has um, for us, they ban uh, us from importing the uh, medical devices. And so uh, we have to make them by ourselves to save our lives. Uh, then um, I want to talk about the uh, technology and how we make this um, oximeter by only uh, Arduino devices. Uh, we have made this pulse oximeter device using Arduino Nano and MAX 30100 uh, which is the IC uh, from... Um, uh, Nasran, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. Uh, it's just uh, that uh, we, we, we all would like to see something while you're speaking. Uh, so um, yeah. also people are asking for a presentation link or some visuals uh, to better understand what you're oh, talking okay. about. Um, so so if, if you have a way to share something and then, and then you can continue, of course, with your with your... Uh, presentation. Uh, how can I email, for example, the presentation? Uh, the uh, how can I uh, share my PowerPoint to you? Sure, I will. I will send you an email address in in the chat, and then you can resume oh, okay. your 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 speech. Sorry, everyone, but I think this would will help our understanding okay. of uh, of Nastron projects. Okay. Uh, here it is. I cannot see your, uh -huh, okay. Yeah. I will send it to you by now. Just be patient, everyone. We are doing this for, for you. <laughs> Excuse me, because of the problem. I'm uploading my uh, PowerPoint for you. Perfect, okay, thank you. So pl please go on. Okay. Uh, then, okay, the technology. Uh, our device consists of an Arduino Nano and an IC called MAX30100. Uh, the, the IC uh, um, that I said is a, um, is a pulse oximetry and heart rate monitor sensor solution. It combines uh, two LEDs, a, a photo detector, um, and low noise analog signal processing to detect pulse oximetry and heart rate signals. The MAX30100 uh, operates from uh, 1.8 voltage and, uh, till uh, 3.3 uh, and can be powered uh, down through software with a negligible standby current, permitting the power supply to remain um, connected all, uh, at all the times. Um, uh, the wiring and also the programming part of the... You have my voice? Yeah, we are. We can hear yeah. you. I haven't. I just haven't received oh, your okay. presentation yet. Uh, uh, it's uploading, I think. Yeah, yeah. I've, okay. Uh, it, it's uh, uploading now. Okay. Uh, the wiring and also programming parts of the device uh, is so simple, and uh, all of them uh, can be found in the net. Uh, so with this IC and an Arduino, we can have a compact device that will be possible to carry out uh, the measurements and also send the data to another device by adding a Bluetooth module. Uh, 
this test uh, may be slightly less accurate, but it's very easy for doctors and people at home to perform. Uh, so uh, we rely um, on it for fast readings. You can easily build this device at your house and uh, check, for example, uh, the, your uh, oxygen, uh, I mean, the, percent, the percentage of your uh, blood oxygen uh, very easily and uh, daily. So uh, you uh, would not need to go to doctors uh, or hospitals um, every, uh, for, for checking or for a test. Because uh, uh, as uh, what uh, the government, our government said, something about 40 percentage of the people who have uh, COVID-19 in Iran uh, get this virus from hospitals. They go, uh, they, for example, they see some signs of the COVID in their cells and they freaking out and they go to hospitals to check if they have the, uh, the disease or not. And then they uh, catch the virus uh, from the environment. Uh, so with this uh, simple and actually uh, inexpensive um, device, which uh, I think it would be um, less than $50, you would uh, save your life, maybe. Uh, so I send this for you. Uh, so I, think we, 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 uh, I think the message sent. Okay, well, uh, I will share it as soon as I get it. We have a question. Have you validated your, uh, your project? Huh? Uh, I had to validate it. Uh, oh, I, I should say that uh, we have uh, tested, we have tested the device in uh, some Iran's uh, uh, hos hospitals too. Okay, also there is a technical question by Luca. Um, another Luca, uh, who is asking, uh, um, uh, why did you use the, the, the 30100 instead of another one, since it's difficult to procure for you? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm the speaker of the group. Uh, the technical ones are, uh, are cannot be uh, Speak, speaking English, so they choose me to talk, but um, this module uh, is, uh, is used in medical uh, needs uh, in the world. I mean, um, the accuracy of it uh, is very high. Um, so uh, the result uh, will, be, um, will be better and you can rely on the results of the uh, this uh, module uh, and what it said. So we choose this. Okay, so thank you. I just got the presentation, so I will share it uh, quickly just to, to let people understand what the, you've the been photo, talking about. Uh, yeah, this is what we have made it. And the left photo is uh, actually the IC. Uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, it's based in Arduino Nano. You are currently uh, producing this in in, yes. in, ma in mass quantities. So, it... um, uh, I think uh, not uh, for large amounts, but we have uh, made something about uh, I think three hundred of uh, it for Iran. Iran uses for free. Okay. Okay, well, thank, thank you also for, for this. Uh, also, we have a... You're welcome. Uh, uh, we ahead for of a few minutes on the schedule. So I would like to invite, uh, if they have something to say, there are two people in this chat uh, who uh, uh, submitted their project, but they are still at a concept uh, stage. Uh, they are uh, um, Mario Milanesio and uh, Luca uh, Scandelli, who are working on... Uh, uh, pulse oximeters as well. So if they have something to, to, to say and comment, which can be useful uh, to, for other people working on these projects, uh, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, let, let them talk. So Ma Mario, uh, if you want, you can. Yeah, yeah. W welcome Mario. <laughs> Ciao Alessandro. <laughs> Hi Alessandro. Um, I'm working uh... On, uh, on something like uh, the, the, the previous uh, uh, girls, 
uh, I don't remember her name, um, because uh, I, I sent you uh, my presentation. Uh, can you share? Because I don't know how. To it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's probably not accessible. We need uh, to be. Sorry. Uh, you, give, you need to give me permission for that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, nice. It should be uh, public right now. Okay, so please go on and I will sh share. Okay. Um, my father has uh, lungs uh, problems uh, from uh, some years from uh, a couple of years. So um, I, uh, he has, a, a, uh, he used a simple device you can find in uh, the fourth uh, slide. Uh, I bought, we bought, uh, I am with my family, bought on this simple oximeter on Amazon, okay? But uh, during this uh, quarantine, uh, it is very difficult to, for me and for my sister to get uh, at my father's home to control if he, he is not so scrupulous. So sometimes uh, he, he doesn't me measure, he, he, should be, he should measure every day because uh, his oxy ox oxygen saturation is not so good, but okay, 93 maybe every day, it should be uh, 93 every day. Sometimes it uh, raises it a little. Sometimes it it lowers. Uh, and and if um, people uh, without any problems has a 97, 98, 99. Okay. So uh, the problem is this for me uh, to have uh, data. Uh, and to control if my father is uh, uh, measuring his, uh, his level, his saturation level. So I thought I can mix two uh, things. Uh, I can mix my ability uh, to send the data to Google Sheets because it is simple or not so difficult and to uh, join um, an MA X3105 uh, uh, from a Spark Fun you can find in the fifth uh, slide, okay, uh, to an ESP8266 or Maker Mille, uh, Maker1000. One, uh, uh, in order to send this data somewhere, I can uh, control. This was my problem, but I thought uh, this could be useful for uh, doctors because uh, uh, we know uh, doctors can go it, it is better doctors uh, doesn't move from their uh, home in order to keep away themselves from uh, COVID. So uh, maybe this, uh, this device could be useful. I, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, there are some libraries, but uh, I, right now I have uh, um, Timoronis, uh, the black one, um, model. I think it is not so, um, there's not uh, real compatibility um, with uh, uh, SparkFun uh, um, library because uh, there are some problems uh, uh, getting values from uh, uh, pools from the art. So I'm, I'm trying to, to, to find the, the, the bug, okay? The next, uh, I will uh, 3D print uh, a simple case, uh, just like this one I found on the Thingiverse, but I, I have to modify this because I want uh, uh, the device to be um, uh, to work on battery and uh, uh, with uh, a small uh, LCD or something just like this uh, in order to show my father uh, the values. So my father will, should use, could use this uh, device just like the other one uh, bought on Amazon, but uh, uh, data uh, get on, on the cloud so I can, uh, uh, I can see uh, real in, just in real time. And uh, uh, this could be useful uh, for, for doctors too. I, I shared a simple uh, 
uh, instructables I made uh, in the, the eight, uh, eight uh, slide. I made uh, some times ago, uh, sharing uh, data over Google Sheets. Uh, I'm, I'm using it, uh, it, it works just, just, uh, just fine. I think maybe it would be better to use uh, some uh, other uh, specific cloud uh, services, but uh, it, it was simple to, to uh, get back uh, data from uh, Google Sheets. So right now I, I'm using this. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, make sure you share your, your project uh, in the forum and, uh, and in, in the community channels of the Arduino community so that other people who, uh, who share the same need can join uh, efforts with you. Because okay. uh, uh, also during this, uh, this track, we have seen that uh, uh, medical devices which, which can help the quality of life of people uh, affected by COVID-19 and people around them uh, are not limited to ventilators or devices directly attached to patients, but, that they, but, but we also need devices that uh, uh, make uh, things easier, share it, collect information and solve a number of problems around uh, COVID-19 also. Uh, connected to that. So thank you very much. Um, Lucas Candelli, do you want to say something quickly, maybe, uh, since you, um, uh, I'll, uh, since you, yeah, if you, if you want to, yeah. Uh, um, okay, I, I just <laughs> attend uh, the presentation because I was interesting uh, in these things. I, I don't know, uh, uh, I just want to, I, I put a link uh, in the chat uh, where I collect some ideas about this uh, oximeter because uh, I have uh, I had the same uh, issues as Mario uh, to, to check um, uh, uh, from, from my house other, other people. And uh, here in Italy, as Mario knows, <laughs> Uh, there are um, not so many uh, nurses or uh, uh, physicists that can go to the houses and check uh, uh, the patients, the, the people. And uh, as uh, uh, Nastaran said, uh, uh, there is also the possibility that going to the hospital, uh, they, they became, become healed. So I, I just had the same idea I had, but my problems are where to procure the, uh, the the sensor because uh, everything is uh, uh, delayed due to uh, the logistics and uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, this is one point and but, but while the second point that, that I, I wanted to suggest uh, if you if you access the link uh, I uh, you can see that you, you can even map uh, through with uh, open street map uh, and uh, uh, umap uh, the uh, the level on the map the, the level of the um, of the um, concentrations so one nurse can uh, uh, um, uh, i don't know how to share the, the screen <laughs> can uh, see in real time the situation of many uh, say tenth uh, Hundred uh, patients. It depends on the situation in your country, and uh, in real time uh, see uh, what happens. And uh, the 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 fastest uh, route to to go there and uh, intervene uh, if there is a real problem, if the oxygen level goes uh, below a, a level. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. There is a there is a big interest in, around this project. Uh, um, they are needed uh, almost everywhere, and uh, so so I really encourage you all, uh, Mario, Luca, but also see that Luca Toldo is commenting with technical questions uh, about security and, and other technical choices. I invite you to uh, to 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 work together in in the Arduino forum. Can uh, can I also make a yeah, Massimo. To make a quick suggestion because I've been looking into this topic for uh, another project, and um, I would suggest that you look at the AFE forty four ninety from Texas Instruments. So basically, it doesn't include the infrared 
sensors. You have to provide infrared LEDs yourself, but it is available from a number of distributors right now in reasonable amount uh, and as a number of uh, simple uh, uh, design, um, design examples that you can build. Uh, so AFE4490, exactly that one. Check it out. There's even a company I found which sells the clip with the cable on it. They are a bit expensive because they are replacement parts for actual machines. So they cost about 90 euros, but you can get the full thing with the sensors and the cable and the connector. So, what do you mean? Sorry, Great. why did somebody says please stop him? <laughs> no, he is not referring to you, Massimo. Don't worry. Uh, there is some noise in the in the chat. But uh, anyway, so um, we have a few minutes left. I would like to invite the last speaker, uh, who is Miguel uh, uh, Fernandez uh, Rodriguez. Uh, just let me uh, let me enable him. Uh, Welcome, Miguel. Thank you. Uh, From the Spanish maker community. Exactly. Um, let me see if I find how to how to share the screen. There is a green button. Yeah. Ah, uh, share. Yeah, of course. Um, okay. So this should should do it. Let's see. Okay. So you, we can see it. Okay. Let's see if I press F five. <laughs> if you still see it, you still see it. We do. Good. Okay. Thank you. So I present myself. Basically, I'm, I'm Miguel Angel. As, as, as Alessandro said, I'm, I'm working at the University of Barcelona and I'm working with the coronavirus uh, makers. And we are basically, this is a, a little bit far. That's why probably I'm the last speaker, uh, far from the Arduino, because here we don't have Arduinos. But I think that is also very important and, and I hope that you, you, you agree with me after the presentation. Basically, it's about masks. So basically open hardware, um, surgical and filtering masks. Uh, we've, we've been basically developing different uh, kind of solutions. And as you can see here, I hope that uh, you can see my, my pointer. Uh, so basically this one here is basically done with a coffee filter. It, it takes only two minutes. And this is kind of like the, 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 the standard uh, mask that everyone should have. Like this is the, the equivalent of of the social uh, distancing, uh, this this is something we should always wear, right now. Uh, on top of that, probably you are you are aware of this um, very uh, creative and very developed uh, 3D printed um, masks, in which basically the problem is that we don't have the filters. So uh, one thing is about the safety of using the 3D printed uh, masks, and the other one is basically that we don't have, we don't have right now uh, a lot of stock of filters so in itself is a challenge so basically uh, as I was getting uh, calls from basically hospitals that they were running out of uh, masks in, even in the ER room uh, then basically I, I started to, to search uh, for anything that I could make for them um, then I, I got this uh, solution that is called the Boston model. It, it was developed in the Boston Children's Hospital. And this is basically like the last resort uh, thing that they can use the, the, the physicians in, in the ER room. So, uh, this, is a, this is really uh, uh, interesting in the sense that the ventilation ventilator filters, uh, as this one, but probably all the people that is uh, um, reading about the, the, the ventilators and the respirators, you, you are aware of this kind of, of filter. Um, this is available. This is available in any hospital right now. And even the, the production chain is open in, in, in all countries, uh, at least in, uh, even in Spain where <laughs> every, we, we lack a lot of other things. Um, so this one is open and we have uh, resources around this. The problem is about the, the anesthesia masks that you see here, because this is uh, something that takes time to, to, to to do and also to it is not done in some so much quantities is we are never prepared for a pandemic um, and, and then basically we wanted to to give this solution something that can be used instead of the anesthesia mask from the community so for this basically we develop uh, um, with a team uh, of course involving uh, physicians and, and involving uh, designers and so 
we, we came up with this one. So it, it, is, it, it looks very ugly, but all, everything there has a function. And, um, and what you can see is basically that with this one, you can already uh, put one of these H HME antiviral filters, the, the kind of uh, filters that I was just explaining in the last slide. Uh, but also we are developing these for being modular with, with these other uh, kind of filters that still there is some stock. It's not like there is a lot, but still there are like tens of thousands, for example, in, in, only in Spain. Um, we, everything we develop is, of course, open source, is, is open hardware, and then you can, uh, you can also download the, the models and everything in, in the GitHub link that you have here. Um, then here you can see basically the, the, this is the prototype uh, in, in Filaflex, so basically this is flexible, uh, but this is not the way to go for ER rooms because the, the Filaflex and every other uh, additive manufacturing, you know that there are some defects and some tolerances and there are also even the, the issue of porosity in the micron scale, which I will talk in the last slide. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of very um, negligible in a, in a, in a low risk um, a scenario, like for example, I don't know, like, like, like a police or, a, or, or in, a, in a supermarket, that can be good. Uh, but in a ER room where the density of virus is in, in suspension, because they are aerosol, they are colloids in suspension, um, is, is very high, so there is not an option to take any risk. So this is only the prototype and we need to move for injection in, in, in rubber, in silicone or any other, any other material like this. No? So here you can see the, the, the proof of concept. So one thing that uh, many people is not aware of is that this kind of filter is already prepared for, uh, for sustaining the, breath, the breathing of a, of a patient. So basically already has the, the, the ability to, to work as a filter uh, in, a, in a mask. Uh, of course, this needs to be done in collaboration with, uh, with, the, medical, uh, with the medical workers, but with the physicians because they are the ones that are going to use it. And if they are not, um, if they are not uh, basically trusting the, the design behind, there is no point that we are doing it. So we for sure need the input from physicians. We, we, in, we integrate them in the, in the developing team. We need to go for validation. Homologation, maybe, uh, maybe we need to do the, the full homologation, but at least a validation, because again, this is a very high risk uh, environment in the ER rooms, so we need to go for those tests. We really didn't, we, we need to quantify how much this mask is um, is isolating the, from from the viruses outside. Uh, it's not like we want to avoid that, but we are asking the government to 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 take it easy in the bureaucratic part, and, and, and of course maintain all the all the all the rest of the all the tests. And then, of course, one thing that I, I need to stress is that this is only possible if we locate and mobilize all the local industry around the, the injection or even um, in the hospital supplies and so for, for locating where these, these filters are, are producing in your country. And the last slide, sorry, here. It's about the, the I don't know, may, probably you are not aware, probably you are, uh, but basically the additive manufacturing uh, has a problem and this is on the, on the web already. It's about the, the, the pores. So basically uh, the claims is that it's not easy and it's not safe to use uh, additive manufacturing for pieces that are gonna be in, in, in as, as a filtering mask. And the reason is that Indeed, when you you take a look on, on the first layer printed on a this is PLA, uh, on on then you will see this kind of holes. The, this probably you don't see clearly, but this is the the scale bar is 10 microns. So here we have holes in the range of the of the of the yeah less than 10 microns. But of course the the virus is 60 nanometers to 140 nanometers, so there are plenty of room to to go through. But the masks are not done with only one layer. They are done with several layers. So if you do the maths, in, in principle, as, as you have many layers with random pores, then it's very, it's very negligible that you have a, a connected path that the virus can go uh, from one layer to the next. Again, this is something negligible in the case of low risk, like in, like for, like in, 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 in the street. But it's, we cannot take even this risk in the um, in the year room. 
So one solution is basically uh, that we can coat it with any polymer. And for example, it could be that easy as uh, coating it with Vaseline or with uh, with any or, um, with any um, uh, cream that is not water based but oil based. And uh, this is this is the, the the same picture of the same the same kind of PLA uh, media. But then in this one it has a PEG a polyethylene glycol uh, layer on top. And then you see that basically it seals all the pores. And another route, it could be basically to do this kind of acetone vapor baths for ADS, or you can use PHF for, for PLA. Uh, but this needs to be done in a very controlled way. So I would really recommend to do this only in, in, in more developed uh, facilities like a pub lab or something like that. Uh, but again, you can see from these two SEM images that uh, this is before the treatment with the acetone bath, and this is after, and then you can see here that the first layers are are really shield, shielding from from outside, and then you don't have, you don't have any more the pores. Again, I would really recommend to go for injection always in the ear room, but also consider that there are other ways that you can make the the, the three D printing safe also in this kind of harsh environment. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel, for for this project. Uh, although it's not pay. Uh, uh, it, it does not involve electronics. Uh, it was still important to uh, to feature this in this conference, as many many people in the Arduino community are also working with uh, this kind of 3D printing uh, uh, projects. Uh, and yours uh, has a very well thought, uh, and your experience uh, was very important to, to share with other people. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to uh, our speakers. This track ends now. However, in a few minutes we will uh, move uh, on to the next track in this room, which is uh, dedicated to technology, technology and manufacturing challenges. So we will also uh, uh, have uh, the uh, speakers and the guests uh, that attended the, the other track uh, about the ventilators. Uh, they, uh, they will also come to this uh, room uh, to talk uh, and discuss uh, uh, how to uh, how to go uh, how to move from a concept uh, to uh, to to production to to uh, mass availability of this project. Uh, uh, so technology and manufacturing challenges. We will start in a few minutes in uh, in this room. Uh, I didn't mention this, but in, in room one, another track is starting dedicated to legal and certification challenges. So we really encourage everyone uh, uh, to, um, every representative of a project uh, to invite another team member so that they can uh, attend both rooms in parallel.
Uh, good evening, everybody. So we are starting again. We are uh, we are we are going to start this final track of this uh, conference. Uh, in this room, we are going to talk about the, the technology and manufacturing challenges. How do we go from a concept or a prototype to mass availability of the projects we are discussing today? Uh, in, uh, in the other room, so room one, you will find the YouTube link on the website. You, uh, uh, there is a, a track dedicated to the legal uh, challenges, so certifications uh, and uh, related topics. So if you're interested in that topic, go to room one. Uh, I am happy to um, to present uh, uh, our colleague uh, Dario Pennisi, uh, who is responsible for hardware development in Arduino. Welcome, Dario. Ciao, Alessandro. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dario is uh, is here with us uh, as uh, an, an expert. We can really say that uh, of manufacturing. Uh, uh, so uh, you can uh, ask questions to him. Uh, about uh, uh, all your concerns regarding uh, manufacturing and especially sourcing parts, uh, which uh, might be not easy as usual during these uh, tough times. Dario. Yep. All right. So um, shall we start with the questions or uh, may I go through a short presentation that I put together? Uh, I, I think you can start with your presentation that could serve as, right. a, as a nice breaker. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, people are free to post their questions in the chat. Oh, of course, yes. I think you have to stop sharing. Thank you. All right. So, um, so first of all, um, a short uh, summary of what's happening around. <laughs> Maybe everyone of you already figured out, but uh, the uh, impressive thing is that uh, the virus has gathered uh, the community around a common enemy. And this is impressive because there are uh, a huge amount of projects, uh, mainly from uh, for ventilators and um, uh, there is a, uh, it's very hard to track them all. Uh, it's, it's impressive because most of them share, um, let's say a common ground in terms of uh, the, the, uh, the architecture and so on, but uh, some of them have very interesting um, approaches. And most importantly, some of them uh, uh, really tackle the, uh, um, uh, the aspect of uh, making sure that uh, components are available everywhere and so on. So that's that's really uh, key for this. Uh, the other important thing is that uh, the, um, uh, I mean, there, there is a need for a lot of other stuff other than ventilators. And uh, some of these are oximeters, uh, temperature sensors, position tracking and, and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, let's not uh, forget that uh, before getting in intensive care, uh, there are a lot of things that we can do and it's really important that uh, we think about how to handle that. So that, that is really the last resort. So uh, of course, uh, one of the suggestions I can, uh, I feel to make uh, to everyone which is uh, willing to contribute is that, I mean, hospitals are uh, lacking uh, places in, uh, in the intensive care. And uh, at least in Italy where <laughs> As you may all know, we had uh, a very uh, bad situation. Uh, although things are recovering, we still have uh, a lot of issues. And uh, although it's always possible to try to create an hospital in 10 days, like in China and, and, and in Italy, it's not really the solution. So uh, most likely uh, people that uh, is being affected is going to be treated at home. And so I would encourage everyone uh, willing to uh, do something to think about what can be done for people at home that is sick and can be uh, treated, can be somehow followed remotely and things like that. Also, keep in mind that uh, designing a ventilator might seem the, the nicest thing in the world, but uh, those that kind of equipment is very dangerous. It can kill people. So uh, 
that stuff uh, very likely uh, needs to be certified and uh, medical staff uh, should be somehow comfortable with that. So it means uh, it must have a sort of, you know, a medical uh, proven interface. Uh, also, it's very important uh, to have a look at uh, what you can do, as I was mentioning before getting to the uh, last stages of, uh, of this virus. And um, so it's really important and probably a lar much larger scale problem, uh, tracking contagion and, uh, and checking symptoms in the very early stage. Now, there is a problem in, in terms of, uh, the, uh, um, of the kind of problems that, uh, uh, sorry, of the kind of approaches that uh, the two sides of uh, technicians are taking. Uh, medics, on one hand, know very well what to do, but uh, they're lacking very likely engineering skills. Uh, they may go wrong on the kind of sensor selection or on the kind of motor or the power supply, uh, the software development, and uh, how to, let's say, make sure that all of this stuff that works together is uh, reliable. At the same time, engineers uh, very often read the specs and think they know everything, but uh, they don't know what is really required from the medical perspective. And uh, I have seen a lot of projects where basically uh, people has designed things and then uh, just at the end uh, thought about uh, looking at uh, medical specifications for that kind of device. And, uh, and of course, one of those uh, big issues is the uh, uh, hardware failsafe. An engineer usually thinks about adding a lot of sensors, a lot of closed loop uh, controls and stuff like that. But actually, uh, we all know that things can break and uh, it's very important to have uh, hardware failsafe because uh, as, a, as it was very clearly stated in the, in the other session, uh, basically, if you put too much pressure or uh, reduce the pressure too much, uh, you are going to kill the patient. And again, uh, we are engineers. I am <laughs> one of those that like to add uh, as many features as possible. And uh, we, over, we always end up uh, overcomplicating everything. So uh, let's keep it simple. Simple, stupid. <laughs> right. Let's keep it, uh, let's say, manufacturable, uh, the least possible amount of parts, uh, the most uh, easy to source. Uh, I mean, think about the fact that uh, there are places where very likely motors, motor controllers, but even AMBU bags are not easily available. And uh, this kind of shortage will increase with the demand and uh, with the fact that uh, even logistics is a nightmare today. Couriers are not delivering anymore. Um, and of course, <laughs> one last thing is, everyone talks about industry 4.0, uh, connectivity and so on. Keep in mind that hospitals usually don't like having wireless. Wireless is not something that is uh, considered reliable. And uh, so, I mean, if you have to connect your stuff, think about wired possibly, and think about the fact that uh, every data that you take out of uh, a medical machine is uh, sensible data. And uh, there are, at least in Europe, very strong uh, laws pre uh, preventing this information to uh, be distributed. Now, uh, the very interesting thing is that uh, in these days, uh, there have been a number of uh, initiatives which uh, shared links uh, for um, complete designs or requirements for ventilators. And uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, the first one, the first link is, is um, probably the most interesting because uh, that is the full design of a, a medical unit that uh, has been approved and actually is in production. So uh, it is very important uh, to have a look at that because that really uh, brings a lot of information. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, the UK government actually shared a uh, very detailed um, uh, say specification list for what is required and what is optional. So uh, that is really uh, something you should have a look at. 
And uh, finally, there's uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, projects which are doing a very good work in sharing their uh, roadmaps, uh, their documentation, and so on. And I encourage you to have a look at those. So uh, the bottom line is uh, our community is uh, made of uh, makers and we love to do stuff ourselves. But uh, when we talk about uh, medical uh, equipment, we have to think about uh, uh, three very important things. The uh, first one is redundancy and uh, reliability. So first of all, uh, this should not uh, absolutely fail. Uh, if it fails, then there must be some safeguard, something that allows uh, the hardware to, uh, let's say, prevent the patient to be harmed. And, uh, and of course, if you have a sensor, probably you need at least two or three because uh, something can break. Remember that uh, uh, ventilation means uh, moving uh, air in and out probably one time a second or I mean, one time every two seconds. So there are a lot of there is a lot of stress on every mechanical part, and uh, and this uh, should be uh, up there for quite a lot of time. Also, it must be solid. Uh, I mean, as makers, we are usually happy when we have a lot of wires uh, hooked up and uh, and somehow have it working, but uh, in this case. Uh, there is a, a very important aspect, which is this equipment, especially if it's going to be in an hospital to treat a uh, patient, uh, which is in critical conditions, must be easy to clean, uh, must uh, sustain uh, liquid splashes, and by liquid splashes, it can be anything. I mean, it can be vomit, it can be blood. I mean, uh, we're talking about people that is really sick. And then approvals. I mean, uh, it's very important that uh, if you start something, uh, you already have on your roadmap uh, clinical trials and animals and, and humans, and you know how to handle that because, uh, I mean, if you're not getting there, don't even start. There are a lot of other things that you can do that uh, are needed and uh, which are very useful. So uh, let's try to keep the efforts concentrated on the few things that really uh, are working. So in terms of uh, manufacturing in volumes, let's say that uh, you planned everything, you designed everything, and now you want to uh, manufacture. Uh, there are a few things that you have to take into account uh, from uh, day zero. The first one is design for manufacturing. Uh, what this means is that uh, you have to, first of all, make sure that uh, the components you select are available and will be available from uh, the uh, supply chain that you're selecting and that you have at end. Uh, this is not really trivial because uh, if you just look at uh, distributors uh, without talking to anyone, you may not know that uh, uh, some components are going to be end of life, for example, or that they are uh, just available as a limited stock uh, after which you have uh, 14, 16, 20, 50 weeks uh, of lead time. Uh, so it's very important that you talk uh, either with a silicon vendor or with the distribution to make sure that those components uh, are and will be available during the production lifetime. Secondly is the manufacturability. Um, very often designs are full of connectors, harnesses, and uh, many different parts. So this means that the manufacturing the, uh, the system, uh, not just a board, will become uh, very complex and uh, it will take a lot of time and will make also the, uh, the whole product probably a bit more critical. So uh, a review on, uh, on uh, the design, on the basis of the design is really, really important. And finally, you have to uh, make sure that testing, production testing is uh, also not enough, an afterthought. Uh, if you deliver something, you want this to be working and you have to make sure that, uh, uh, I mean, every unit has uh, the same features of the one that you uh, validated. So uh, not only you have to test uh, as much as possible, but you have to make sure that the coverage is uh, high enough to make sure that uh, uh, every device that you ship is compliant. And then finally, when you uh, completed the, the testing, then you have to make sure that, first of all, 
all of your uh, devices are, let's say, all of the components required to assemble the devices are available through your supply chain. And uh, the delivery is working because, uh, I mean, you can manufacture a lot of stuff, but then you have to deliver. And uh, this means making sure that uh, the couriers will uh, bring uh, goods in time where it's needed. Keep in mind that uh, there are areas which are under lockdown and uh, so you may need to have special agreements with, with governments and with couriers to deliver in, in particular areas, especially the, the, the ones that are uh, most affected. And finally, I mean, since shit happens, <laughs> everyone knows about it. Even if you tested it very well, uh, something may go wrong or uh, the user may have trouble operating your device. So you have to make sure that um, uh, you have means to, uh, to support uh, your users. Again, we are talking about uh, thousands of, uh, of infections and uh, thousands of uh, ventilators and uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, people ill. So we have to make sure that uh, there is a structure behind uh, whatever you are designing that uh, is gonna be able to, uh, to support whoever is using that. So uh, what we are doing uh, in Arduino is uh, first of all, well, we opened immediately a page uh, under uh, the Arduino website, uh, COVID-19, where uh, you can get information about what we're doing, what is our level of operation and uh, uh, about the events like this. And we also added a very important link, which is contact us where basically we are asking you to contact us directly if you have a critical project for which uh, you need uh, a large supply of boards so that we can make sure that uh, you get what you need. Of course, uh, if you see stock around, you can order that. Uh, but uh, if you talk to us directly, we can make sure that, uh, uh, first of all, um, that uh, the quantities you need are uh, stocked for you. And uh, if those are not in stock, we can get you uh, the lead times. And also we can provide you personalized quotes based on volumes. So we understand that uh, of course our prices are uh, based on uh, single pieces, at least on the stores. So if you're talking about uh, tens of thousand pieces, then of course we are very willing to help you. And uh, finally, uh, not least important, uh, I am, committed to providing hardware and firmware design support to whoever is uh, something relevant. So feel free to contact us uh, either through the forum or uh, through the forum we have uh, on the Arduino website or via uh, Discord or whatever means you wanna and uh, you wanna reach out and uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to support you as much as possible. So finally, uh, I'll try to uh, show you a small comparison because most of the designs that we have seen so far are more or less based on uh, the same products. So right now the, the products which are mostly used are the nanos because they are really uh, low cost and uh, they provide more or less whatever is needed for uh, small PLCs, which is more or less whatever is uh, needed for a ventilator, uh, a simple ventilator. Uh, so let's say, Nanos, Unos, and Mega are the, the most used ones. Uh, Mega probably is the one that uh, has been uh, more, let's say, interesting for the more complex devices where people is using uh, multiple uh, motors or multiple uh, sensors. Uh, so of course, this um, the, the design, the, the board you, you choose is basically uh, depending heavily depending on um, the uh, complexity of your design. And uh, although we are not uh, yet shipping it in volumes, uh, we are also advising some people for advanced designs to use Portenta, which is our uh, latest brainchild, which uh, is designed for, uh, let's say, more uh, complex uh, applications. It has um, high-res graphics with DisplayPort and so on. So on that one, uh, of course, we are not recommending it to everyone for the simple reason that it is, uh, is um, quite different from uh, uh, the usual Arduino designs you're uh, using. But um, 
I mean, if you think you have the need for that, and especially if you are planning to use something like uh, a, a complex user interface and so on, maybe this is for you because that will help you in understanding something which is robust, industrial temperature, and uh, will last uh, for quite a lot of time in very extreme temperatures as well. All right, so that's more or less it. So I hope I didn't take too much time and uh, I'm waiting for your, for your questions. Uh, Dario, you will not wait too long because we already got a number of uh, questions <laughs> <laughs> during your, your presentation. So okay. uh, um, Robert Reid, uh, who uh, was one of the speakers who introduced this conference uh, uh, is, uh, is interested in in, in what you said about uh, not using Wi-Fi. Uh, he's asking, uh, what are the issues with wireless and can we count on uh, a Cat5 Ethernet instead? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm not an expert on, uh, on medical environments, but uh, it is my understanding that uh, it's preferable not to have uh, any source of uh, radio frequency close to other medical devices. Uh, even if, uh, I mean, you know that uh, this kind of stuff is uh, somehow, uh, let's say, um, certified not to be affected by that. Uh, that is, of course, uh, something you have to take into account. Uh, the other important thing is that uh, wireless is not that reliable. I mean, uh, anything can happen. Uh, someone can uh, come up with uh, a high energy RF source, uh, which is disturbing the communication, and you don't really want to, uh, to be affected by that. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, Wi-Fi uses uh, a... Um, a free part of the spectrum so anyone can transmit there and it's very easy unless you have a very strong infrastructure to be jammed by other transmissions so uh, of course uh, ethernet is much more robust because uh, it is uh, absolutely under control and uh, other than that i mean uh, there are a lot of applications which are still using zero ports or other wired communication mm -hmm. uh... And if there is another question by, by, by Robert, uh, um, which probably um, tack, tackles the, 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 ma the, main, uh, the main cons um, building these projects. Are some Arduinos in greater supply than others? Well, that's a very good question. We are trying to uh, prioritize the uh, requests and uh, the, the last slide I show uh, is basically already sort of an answer. So we are prioritizing the nanos, uh, which are more or less the most requested, uh, the unos and uh, the mega. The, those are the ones that uh, have been uh, mostly used in, uh, let's say 80% of the designs uh, that use Arduino. Uh, there are some other fancy things, uh, but uh, we are trying to steer everyone on, on the same boards so that uh, we can limit the, um, the, kind of, the kinds of boards that uh, we manufacture. Um, at the moment, uh, we are not seeing uh, capacity problems, but uh, of course, we need to have some planning. So whoever has a, a real project and uh, it's uh, somehow willing to go in production soon. Uh, we can plan it in advance. Um, yeah, uh, there is, um, uh, well, there, there is some, uh, still some discussion about the, the connectivity uh, topic. Uh, um, uh, Robert is asking, uh, will clinics have wired Ethernet? Um, actually, we do have uh, some uh, Ethernet shields for uh, Uno and Mega, and uh, we have Ethernet on top of uh, Portenta. So these are the boards supporting uh, uh, Ethernet. Uh, yes. Yeah, the product recommended for, for Ethernet connectivity. Mm. Uh, I would like, well, while uh, other questions are, are flowing, uh, I would like to, to, while we collect the questions, I would like to ask you, uh, what, uh, uh, I know you attended uh, the previous track uh, about ventilators, about Arduino-based yep. ventilators. I would like to ask you, 
uh, what are your impressions uh, after uh, hearing that uh, long uh, uh, list of um, efforts by, by the community in terms of, in terms of technological uh, challenges uh, what what they'll need to do uh, and uh, what level of maturity did you see uh, well actually there's a lot of um, uh, there's really a lot of designs and uh, we have seen uh, some of them uh, being uh, pretty mature. Some of them are uh, already in uh, experimentation on uh, animals and uh, soon will be on, uh, on people. So I have uh, very high hopes that uh, very soon uh, at least some of these designs will, uh, will get uh, used um, in, uh, in real life. Uh, as I was mentioning, the uh, the most important thing is that uh, the um, uh, let's say these designs have, uh, have been thought of uh, with different goals in mind. Uh, some of them are using uh, very common parts, and that's very interesting because uh, this can, those can be easily replicable. I think that one of the issues with that kind of concept is that uh, if you do an open design that uh, then can be assembled by anyone. I think the issue there is that um, you may end up having no one manufacturing it. I mean, uh, if you have this community creating something, then uh, uh, probably you have to also make sure that that community has people around the world which is ready to manufacture that uh, following a very strict procedure. So uh, let's not just um, uh, keep this, uh, let's say, one inch from the end. Uh, let, let's try to think about the whole process. And, and that's my message to everyone which is designing uh, something, not just the ventilators, because as I was mentioning, uh, there are very big pitfalls uh, waiting for you on uh, manufacturing, on logistics and so on. And I think it's really, really important because um, it's, it's very easy to fail here. I mean, for example, we have shipped uh, boards from uh, Turin, uh, from Biella to Turin. The distance is uh, 40 minutes uh, by car, and it took 10 days because the, uh, the the courier was not actually able to deliver them because they were overwhelmed. So that's exactly my point when I was talking about the supply chain and uh, and the delivery. It's it's really critical right now. Uh, Dario, so far we talked about uh, the, the, the very hardware part and, and uh, manufacturing. Uh, uh, what, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, uh, also the, 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 the safety uh, issues, uh, uh, speaking of software? I mean, uh, is there any, any good practice you would recommend in terms of, for example, decoupling the, the logic of, uh, of these devices? Uh, splitting interface from, uh, from core uh, functionality in terms of be best practices we can, uh, we can tell to our community. Yeah, actually there, uh, there's one big thing uh, that um, let's say works very well uh, with uh, newcomers to the programming world in Arduino, uh, which doesn't work very well in, in some of these applications, which is the, uh, the loop thing. So basically the, the Arduino uh, software structure uh, is mainly a setup and a loop where basically you are supposed to have a big state machine doing things. In reality, uh, there are libraries that allow you to do sort of multitasking and um, those are, let's say, the things that make things a bit more complex uh, because basically usually you want to have uh, on the same board uh, the logic that drives, uh, let's say, the application, and then uh, some logic that uh, displays the user interface or the handles the, uh, the input and so on. So uh, in that case, it's, uh, it's a bit tricky if you don't uh, handle things correctly because uh, you may end up uh, screwing up the um, uh, core logic if you spend too much time, for example, updating the user interface. So that is really something that needs uh, some attention and uh, some good profiling. And at the same time, uh, it's also one of the reasons why, uh, let's say we thought about uh, Portenta, which is a dual core where you can uh, have two separate processors doing two completely different things. So you can have uh, Python running on one side and uh, Arduino running on the other. So with 
the Arduino, you do the low level, and uh, with Python, you may do, for example, the user interface. These are these are advanced uh, 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 hints for for developers, but since uh, we are talking about critical devices, uh, they are not uh, never advanced enough. Uh, no, I mean the, the the real problem here is, uh, as I was mentioning, also redundancy. So, for example, a good design might be to have uh, several boards, uh, not just uh, let's say processing boards, but also sensors, and and make sure that you read all of them and have uh, tribal voting. So, uh, for example, if you need to measure pressure, uh, and one of the pressure sensors may break. Then uh, you have to have three and uh, and say get the uh, the most likely value out of the three. Uh, the same happens for uh, for the mechanics and uh, and for the uh, electronics. You may want to have two different boards: one driving the uh, application and one driving the um, the user interface. Unless you have a dual core processor like this. Uh, and uh, and what about power supply? How critical is is that part? Uh, is, is there a risk of uh, uh, not uh, putting enough uh, uh, attention on, uh, on, that, on that topic. Yeah, one of the lessons that uh, I learned uh, while trying to support uh, some of these designs is that uh, it's a bit hard to understand how much force you need to compress the uh, uh, ambu bag or I mean to send uh, air into the lungs of a patient. And uh, because basically the, the amount of resistance you get uh, varies quite a lot uh, depending on the, on, the, on the patient. So the amount of power that you have to give to the motor is very high. And uh, I've seen projects where they started with a small motor and uh, with a servo actually, and then they migrated to very big stepper motors uh, or uh, let's say linear actuators. So um, let's say that uh, first of all, over designing in this case is a very good practice and uh, you may want to have uh, of course a very big motor driver and a very big motor so that uh, it can sustain uh, a full day operation. I mean this is something that should work uh, 24 hours a day uh, with the motor which is almost uh, working uh, every time uh, for, for the full time in both directions. <laughs> so there's uh, I mean a lot of reliability issues there. And of course, the power supply must be able to sustain this. Don't just assume that it's good enough, uh, measure it. I mean, if you, if you think that uh, you have something which is close to the limit, measure the power supply because it may dip and uh, may cause unwanted results. Um, right. Uh, um, I think we will get back to the, to the, to the power supply topic because there, I see some, uh, some, some debate in the, in the in the chat, uh, uh, but I but I also uh, wanted to ask you about the 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 MKR boards since uh, yep. so some people are asking about them and uh, since there I see I see a, an, uh, quite a bit of interest about connectivity. The connectivity topic is raising uh, doubts. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It is it is my fault actually. Um, I should have mentioned it. So of course, among those boards, uh, we also have uh, Maker Zero, which is also very interesting. So it's uh, somehow a basic board which has uh, a Cortex M0, the same that's on the Nano IoT. And uh, the interesting thing about the maker is that um, the family allows you to change uh, the, um, to swap the board uh, having a different kind of Uh, boards with uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. depending on uh, what you are looking for, you can get uh, the board of your uh, of your needs. And of course, uh, over that one, we also have uh, shields for Ethernet, for CAN, uh, RS-485, uh, temperature sensors, uh, thermocouples, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, meanwhile, I see that uh, um, Sherman Chen is commenting uh, on uh, on your thoughts about redundancy and especially mentioning the the, the portenta, which 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 is uh, uh, one of, one of uh, the, the values of the portenta is is in uh, having a, the, the possibility of this kind of redundancy between the different cores. So this is something that 
Well, looks interesting for our yeah, let audience. Let me also add that uh, the, the other interesting thing about Portent is that uh, it also has um, uh, two kinds of crypto chips. So if you really, really want to uh, send data to the cloud and uh, you're allowed to, uh, you can use very strong security by storing uh, certificates and, uh, and keys into this uh, secure elements. Um, right. One while, of the two. while while you mm -hmm. were not uh, in this room and during the previous track, uh, we were talking about uh, pulse oximeters and uh, collecting data from pulse oximeters to the cloud, especially to monitor uh, elder people remotely. And and people were commenting about security of this uh, data transfer. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That is a that is a huge issue. Uh, I mean, uh, of course. You can think that uh, storing a password in your code is uh, robust enough if you protect your uh, code in the microcontroller, but actually that's not the case. Uh, unfortunately, you have to think about the fact that uh, the world is uh, more and more connected and uh, thinking about the fact that uh, uh, this data might seem useless is, is just a mistake because there's always going to be uh, someone looking for some additional data for improper usage and that uh, will affect you. So think about security even before you start thinking about IoT. Um, right. Uh, the we have oh there's a question about uh, about portenta is the portenta usb power delivery compatible yes it is uh we support power delivery however keep in mind that portenta is five volts only so what it does is uh, it negotiates the amount of current it requires but uh it doesn't use power delivery to let's say um, uh, let the source generate uh, higher voltages uh, we are also able to source uh, um, power from Portenta if needed, also because Portenta has uh, DisplayPort output. So uh, one of the applications we have is um, connecting USB-C to a hub with uh, DisplayPort output or HDMI output uh, along with uh, USB hub and, and things like that. So that really becomes uh, like a, a laptop that uh, you can connect with a keyboard, a mouse, and uh, and uh, a traditional display. Oh yeah, uh, oh, no, there is a very technical question, but I, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, I, uh, we can pretend you you have a complete answer. But what protocols do medical devices typically use? What logic levels are typically used? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't think I have uh, those kind of answers. What I know is that um, there is an open uh, standard for data exchange, which is called uh, DCOM. And um, I have been designing some stuff based on that. Uh, I only know partially. Uh, so I don't really have an answer. But um, if you look for DICOM, uh, you can check there and uh, there is at least uh, some data about uh, how data is exchanged uh, between uh, medical devices. I'm not really sure how data is eventually uh, exchanged between devices in terms of control. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, um... uh, so other, other people uh, mm... We're discussing uh, the um, the the, uh, the redundancy and the decoupling uh, uh, topic, uh, and uh, there was this uh, very technical questions, but interesting for, for for developers. Is it recommended to apply FSM rather than schedulers to trigger tasks in Arduino Uno and Mega? Maybe if we can provide some context about this question, because I'm not sure that everyone yeah, understands yeah, yeah. this. Absolutely. So yeah. the, the, the question is, uh, it, assuming you have uh, an Arduino, as I was mentioning earlier, you have uh, a loop function which is called regularly. So the first thing to remember is that it is called regularly if you exit regularly from uh, the loop function. So for example, if you use a blocking function such as, for example, moving a stepper motor, then uh, remember that, uh, I mean, you cannot do anything else. Uh, while uh, the motor is stepping. And the same applies for other blocking operations such as driving uh, a NeoPixel or things like that. So uh, 
it's really important when you have uh, a state machine uh, that uh, you time exactly uh, the uh, what what is happening, and you take into account for uh, uh, errors. Because, for example, if you have uh, an I square C cable and uh, you have uh, sorry an I square C device, you have a long cable and there is some noise or something, then uh, the device might uh, reply with. Uh, and not acknowledge, which means that you have to retry the operation, for example. So instead of uh, staying into that operation for a short while, you may stay there more than expected, and you have to take that into account. So you have to have timeouts, you have to have uh, and now a number of countermeasures to make sure that uh, the maximum amount of time you spend into each step is, is properly measured. Uh, on the other side, if you go for multitasking uh, with a scheduler, uh, there are two different ways of doing that. Uh, with a cooperative scheduler, you are able to switch tasks uh, when you give control to the scheduler. So again, um, things are not ever happening in parallel for real. Uh, they are happening only when uh, you are, let's say, not doing something useful, so you are giving control to something else. And uh, there is uh, real multitasking, uh, which we are able to support on some of the new nanos, uh, which run embed and on um, uh, and on portent, of course. Uh, but uh, that uh, also poses a number of other issues because uh, multitasking means that uh, the same processor executes different things sequentially, but you think uh, they are happening in parallel. So you have to take into account that uh, while you're doing something, you might be interrupted and, uh, and resumed uh, slightly later. So for example, you cannot pretend that timings are really, really precise if you're using multitasking. And that's one of the reasons why we uh, started Portenta, which has two processors. So if you really want to have something very timing, uh, let's say with very precise timings, then you can run it on a dedicated processor. That's that's really the whole point. Uh, right, all right. Uh, I would like to to uh, to pick up this this question that was asked, uh, uh, not about electronics, but still, it's a technological challenge related to COVID nineteen projects. Uh, uh, what is your opinion on designs that use many three D printed parts? Three D printing is fairly slow. Would it be too slow for? mass production of large quantities. Uh, I would like to, to give my opinion, but uh, also, uh, also to hear well, yours, Dario. Uh, you are the 3D printer <laughs> wizard, so probably you should answer that. But I, I can give you my opinion, uh, which is probably totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> first of all, never underestimate the community. Um, actually, I think that uh, there has been a lot of discussion about those uh, 3D printed um, adapters for the face masks uh, from uh, Deglon and other makers. Uh, other manufacturers. And uh, basically in Italy, uh, the organization that designed them asked uh, the um, uh, Fab Labs to, to ship over uh, printed parts and actually that happened. So, uh, I mean, 3D printing may be slow, but uh, don't underestimate uh, the power of the community. Uh, my concern about that is uh, really a bit uh, different. It may happen that, uh, for example, you may have, um, faulty parts due to the fact that some 3D printers have uh, less precision and uh, the layers may not uh, stick uh, very well. So th the part might not be, let's say, replicable too much and uh, may not be able to sustain the pressures and the mechanical stress that is involved with uh, this kind of devices. I so totally, yeah, I totally agree with you, with, you, with your points, basically. Uh, the, the effort in, in designing and refining a, a, a project uh, should be in uh, reducing the, the, num the, the amount of 3D printing material, for example, by using uh, uh, ready, readily available um, parts, for example, fasteners, for example, uh, ply uh, laser cut plywood or, or, or other kind of plastics or, or other kind of materials that can be manufactured or, or sourced e more easily. Uh, so it's a compromise. Uh, however, as you as you said, the, the power of the community and the distributed manufacturing is demonstrating that there is a lot of uh, potential manufacturing capability uh, that is being exploited. For example, in Spain, there are community local communities organized in uh, local 
uh, using local uh, Telegram chats uh, so that they can spread the requests uh, uh, to the local chapter who is able to manufacture locally. And this is something that can be really exploited if, uh, if there is a, a good reason for, for this. Um, so uh, going back to, going back to, to electronics uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and software, um, uh, uh, as I think we, we have seen during this conference that the, a number of communities are developing projects uh, um, putting a, a, a lot of uh, attention on the mechanical part. Um, however, it, um, it, we, we are, you also, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, how they should uh, um, work uh, on, 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 on the safety of the device mm -hmm. also from the software point of view. But uh, uh, it, it, I think it's not enough to tell them uh, Take, take care of that part because uh, I think uh, all, the, all those people are, are doing their best. Is there something we, we can, uh, some hint, uh, some good practice we can tell to these community projects uh, so that they increase the level of maturity of their projects, even if they don't have the resources, the skills within the, their team? I guess that uh, here the, the, the point is probably the reason why we started this conference. Um, I was really surprised to see so many designs that uh, look so similar, but are so different. And of course, it's very important to have, uh, you know, a differentiation because uh, you may invent uh, something if uh, maybe if you work by yourself for a while, but uh, the power of working together is, is really what makes the difference. And uh, if I look at the uh, projects that uh, there are around today, some of them have hundreds of contributors. And that's really where things uh, start to fly because of course uh, you may be naive on uh, a topic, but uh, you may be an expert on something else. And when you start discussing topics with other people that have different experiences, then uh, you create a knowledge which is bigger than uh, the sum of the knowledges of, of the participants. And uh, in particular, I think that uh, the, uh, amount of knowledge required for such a device is really huge. And uh, for example, looking at uh, the uh, specifications that uh, you get from the UK government, you get a glimpse of, um, of what's needed. But uh, if you look at the design from Medtronics, that is really key. I mean, it's really, really interesting because they are mapping the requirements of uh, the software and the hardware to specific, uh, to specific medical requirements and, uh, and directives. So you not only know that uh, something is, is needed, but also why. And uh, I mean, as in any cases, I mean, you need to study a lot. Uh, don't pretend uh, that you're the smartest guys in, guy in the room. I mean, uh, you have to look for knowledge for everything that, um, uh, you you don't know uh, enough about. So consult with medics. <laughs> if, it, if it's a medical device, consult with medics. Uh, read the, uh, the documentation and uh, and make sure you understand that. That's that's really the point. And, and consult with a lot, lot of people. Right. Uh, very, very important hint. Uh, we have a technical uh, question. Uh, do you have uh, proper recommendations to shield the boards against EMI? Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> difficult. All right, so uh, if you uh, want to avoid EMIs, first of all, uh, you, you shouldn't need to shield the board. The, the first thing you, you need to do is design the board so that it doesn't emit that. And that is really, really difficult. Um, first of all, it really depends on, uh, on many different aspects. Uh, for example, if you are designing a board which has um, high-speed clocks, then very likely uh, power supplies are going to be the main source of EMI. Because, uh, I mean, you have the clock, which of course is, uh, is critical, but usually that is a very short trace and doesn't have any problem. But what happens is that inside the chip, everything is running at that speed. So the current that goes into the power supply is actually oscillating slightly uh, at uh, that frequency. So that's really where the problems are. So you have to design your uh, power decoupling very carefully. 
and uh, uh, you have to make sure that uh, there is really no ripple. Uh, I mean, if you see ripple on the power supply, that means that you're actually very likely emitting uh, EMI. Um, in addition to that, uh, connectors, cables, uh, those are the places where uh, signals uh, pick up, uh, pin, take off in the air. So basically on every interface, you have to put, of course, uh, ESD protections, which are needed uh, to avoid frying the board when uh, someone, um, let's say, touches the board with uh, a charge on, on it. And, um, uh, and of course, you need to have uh, high-speed inductors to prevent uh, internal frequencies to, to be transmitted over the cables. And then, I mean, if you really, really did everything right, but you still are emitting, uh, there are very way, uh, different ways to shield the board. Um, there are uh, conductive paintings that uh, you can spray within, uh, within the box. This is a very expensive uh, solution, but uh, works very well for uh, artisanal pro uh, products. And uh, otherwise, uh, try to use as much as possible metal boxes, uh, metal shields, and, and so on. Well, the, this was an important topic. Uh, yes, and, the, and the, 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 the person who asked the question is uh, saying that appreciated your, 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 your answer. <laughs> Thanks um, for the question. <laughs> um, uh, I would like to invite uh, the uh, speakers of the, of the, of the panels uh, who are in, attending this one uh, uh, to, uh, to, to comment or to share their thoughts uh, since they actually went through these challenges while making their prototypes. So if they have something to do, just raise your hand and, uh, uh, and uh, we will bring you in the discussion. Um, so you were uh, mentioning uh, um, in your presentation that Arduino is also available to support these communities with uh, design help. Yes. And, and people are asking in, in the chat uh, uh, more information about what, what Arduino is, is doing uh, on, on that uh, front. So. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I am personally uh, discussing with uh, some of the teams. Um, of course, uh, it's going to be impossible for us to support everyone doing, uh, let's say, every sort of hardware. So we are trying to somehow uh, give the best possible answers uh, through the forum, for example. And uh, following up with uh, the groups which have uh, more medical relevance uh, directly. So for some of them, uh, we've wrote some code. Uh, for some of them, we did some uh, design reviews. Uh, for some others, we are just, let's say, helping them in, uh, um, let's say, selecting sensors or uh, sourcing boards and things like that. So, I mean, we are trying really to do whatever is necessary, whatever is required uh, to help. We understand that, uh, I mean, the biggest issue really is not, in my opinion, the, the design. Uh, as I was mentioning, that designing and uh, making sure that the product work is probably half of the uh, journey. The other half is, uh, let's say, manufacturing it, testing it, and delivering it. So I think we are still in the early days, and uh, everyone will see a lot of trouble in front of them. And I mean, we are also willing to help with the uh, sourcing of the components if needed. Uh, of course, again, we, we can't do everything for everyone, but uh, if there is something relevant, uh, we are very happy to help. Uh, you mentioned uh, testing, hardware testing, and uh, I'm thinking that, uh, uh, well, we know that Arduino can be used uh, for a very wide range of purposes, fr from learning, education, to industrial grade uh, applications or professional context. In, in between, there is a, a, lo a lot of, a, a big variety of, uh, of potential applications. Uh, um, what, uh, uh, I th think that many people ha don't, are, are actually moving from simpler applications to more professional uh, applications uh, using Arduino. Um, so testing a prototype uh, is, is a key part of making a reliable product. So, um, 
what, what uh, suggestions can, can we give about properly testing an electronic product, uh, which is, uh, a, 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 it, it's, a, it's a combination of an Arduino board and other components all together. And what is the correct approach to, to properly test this kind of product? Well, first of all, uh, I want to hijack the, your question, um, adding also the concept of validation, because uh, there are two aspects of, uh, of uh, testing. Uh, the first one is validating the design. And the second one, of course, is testing during production. Uh, very often uh, you get uh, problems in manufacturing because you didn't validate properly the, the design and you didn't figure out that uh, something can vary enough uh, that uh, the product goes out of spec, for example. So uh, it's very important to make sure that uh, when you start a design, you have a validation plan and you have a clear idea of uh, what you need to test, what you need to measure in order to make sure that uh, what you are designing is really uh, compliant with uh, your expectations. As I was mentioning, uh, sometimes, for example, uh, I was mentioning it uh, during my presentation, uh, you may assume that uh, something is working just because uh, from the high level perspective, it works. So you try to uh, tell a motor to, to rotate and it rotates and you're happy, but uh, then maybe you connect a load and uh, it doesn't rotate anymore or uh, it, uh, get some dust and uh, the, uh, it becomes harder and harder to rotate and uh, it doesn't work anymore. And maybe you're guaranteeing your system to work for one year in, in extreme conditions. So validation is really, really uh, very, very important. And then um, testing is also very important as you, was, uh, as you were mentioning, because you have to make sure that uh, the manufacturing process allows you to replicate the, uh, the same level of uh, performance of your validated uh, prototype. And this is a really key point. I mean, uh, as Arduino, we have been uh, famous for uh, having very reliable boards and uh, that's something we are very proud of. Um, we manufacture them in Italy, uh, not because uh, Italy is better than everything than anyone else, but uh, just because of the fact that it's, it's close and uh, we have all the process under control. And uh, in addition to that, we test our boards very thoroughly. Uh, I have a guy who's really getting crazy with this. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, as uh, many other people is doing, we are testing Arduino boards with Arduino boards. So um, we are putting together a, um, a test system, which at some point uh, we plan to open source, which uh, is going to be used not only for testing uh, during manufacturing, but also for continuous integration. So this is an effort that um, we are, uh, I think is, is a bit overdue, but um, we are working very hard on that uh, because we want uh, to make sure that uh, the quality of our code uh, improves. And uh, we wanna make sure that uh, whenever someone contributes, the library is tested against all of the hardware it claims is compatible with. Um. Uh, so I was uh, scrolling the the, the chat uh, mm -hmm. uh, since there are still some some questions. There is a, there is a very practical question about uh, uh, power supply. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there a good solution for unstable power supply from like a twelve volt car battery? Okay, so, um, I don't think that uh, a twelve volt car battery is unstable. Actually, it's probably one of the most stable things you can think about. Uh, what is really unstable is the um, is the voltage when uh, uh, you have the cranking. So when you turn on the the engine, and that's because basically the engine requires a lot of current from the battery, and uh, when the engine starts moving, uh, the battery starts to get um, charged. And that, of course, uh, creates all sorts of uh, noises and spikes on the uh, on the power supply. So, of course, if you are designing something which is uh, supposed to be working uh, during, let's say, cranking, then uh, good luck. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of work there. But uh, other than that, uh, let's say car batteries are huge. So they, they act like uh, the biggest capacitors in the world. So, I mean, you shouldn't get any instability there. 
uh, right. I, I think this this kind of um, this person who asked this question uh, says that uh, um, they want to use a battery to solve the 110 volts power supply problems. So we need a circuit oh, okay. to charge the battery while we use the solar. Yeah, I mean, uh, for that, there are, you can actually buy off the shelf um, chargers. Uh, usually, uh, you can find uh, some uh, DC DC converters, which are uh, basically battery char lead battery chargers. And uh, at the same time, they also provide you with the with the power. Basically, they are sort of uh, UPS systems. So they provide you with 12 volts, and uh, these 12 volts are automatically switched uh, between the battery and uh, the power supply. Uh, the battery is continuously charged, of course, and uh, there is also controls for uh, overcharge, undercharge, and so on. So I would say just uh, use those. They, they are sold almost everywhere on Amazon and, and so on. The problem is eventually sourcing them but <laughs> right now, but uh, it is common components, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a question I, I'm not sure I fully understand, uh, but um, no, okay, I, I see that uh, uh, Massimo already answered, the Massimo Bands already answered in, in the chat about uh, availability or the need to manufacture these uh, uh, DC DC converters, um, which are actually available uh, in the market. Um, uh, if, we are reaching the end of this track, but we are st still here for a few minutes in case uh, there are more, more questions about manufacturing, about sourcing parts, about how can Arduino support uh, the communities fighting COVID-19 uh, on the technology side. Um, uh, yeah, the recording of this session as well as the entire conference will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, also, we will re be reachable through, uh, also in our community channels. So if you go to Arduino forum, you will see there is a COVID-19 board dedicated to these topics. So, so the discussion continues there and also in our Discord channel dedicated to the pandemic response by, by the community. Um, there's yeah, let, one, me, yeah, uh, listen, let me just uh, answer that question about um, the, the sourcing. So, uh, of course, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to support uh, smaller communities. Um, uh, we are always there to respond uh, to forum requests and so on. Uh, the, the real problem with sourcing components right now is that uh, you have to take into account the fact that either you have really, really relevant or uh, basically you have to think about the fact that there is someone which is trying to, let's say, solve very big issues and needs prioritization. So for example, in Italy, we had uh, a lockdown which forced uh, all of the companies which are not strictly related to the um, medical supply chain to, to stop, basically. So, uh, I mean, you may say that this is unfair uh, because your project is the most beautiful in the world, but you have to think about the fact that, uh, um, I mean, it's really difficult. As I was mentioning, uh, couriers are having trouble uh, delivering everything. And Amazon, for example, started uh, stopping the delivery of some kinds of goods because they want to make sure that uh, who really needs something uh, gets it. In any case, if, uh, some relevant projects needs help in sourcing parts. We are really close to silicon vendors and uh, we are happy to make connections to make sure that uh, uh, you design in the right parts and uh, you get them when it's needed. Uh, as I was mentioning, we have this form, please fill it in, get in contact with us and uh, we'll make sure uh, that uh, we address your questions as fast as possible. Uh, Dario, we are collecting the final questions. Uh, I want to I wanted to share with you uh, a thought I I, I have uh, seeing uh, what the community is doing uh, um, in uh, as a response uh, to the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, uh, I see that many people are using uh, the, the 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 well known uh, Arduino boards uh, for for their projects uh, because every everybody knows and and, and loves uh, the Arduino Uno and and the and the and the, and the well-known Arduino Nano. Uh, however, 
for, for many applications, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, there are boards that are probably better suited uh, for, for these applications. I mean, the Arduino, the Arduino families are, uh, go, uh, are much more uh, uh, bigger, yeah. bigger, big exactly than, than the Arduino Uno and the Arduino Nano. So uh, I would really like to invite everyone to, to go to the website and, and, uh, and see all the ones you mentioned in your presentation. So the, the new Nanos, uh, the, 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 the MKR boards, uh, uh, which are several boards with different connectivity offering, uh, the, the Portenta and, and, the, and the all the and all the families and actually uh, ask, reach out to us and ask uh, whether anything is not clear because uh, th there might be better options for your projects than the default choice. Yeah, let me let me add uh, something very interesting. I, I mean, of course, uh, everyone loves the uh, what we call the hero products: uh, Uno, Due, Mega, Nano, and so on. However, uh, we really worked hard uh, to evolve and uh, to to give us our users uh, a better experience, uh, more features, and so on. And uh, the one thing that is really outstanding is that you can run. Uh, almost all of the libraries on almost all of the boards. And that's really important because most of the times, uh, whatever code you wrote on a board can seamlessly run on uh, anyone else. And that's really important because if you run out of pins or if you run out of resources, there's always another bigger board that uh, can uh, suit your needs. So, I mean, I gave you some, a list of boards that uh, can be used as preferential because uh, we are prioritizing them in this period of uh, difficulty uh, for the logistics. But uh, if you look at our catalog, we have really a huge amount of products uh, for every possible application. So I really advise you to check it out. Uh, there is a there is an important question. Uh, will the Arduino factory be open to keep up with demand? Because uh, we know that uh, many manufacturers of boards uh, are, are not able to ship. Uh, there is a bit of uncertainty about uh, supply chains. Uh, maybe it, it's it's important to to stress uh, uh, what Arduino is doing in terms of uh, supplying uh, and keeping up with the, with the demand. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, we are collecting and uh, if you have uh, more information about that, please <laughs> do that. We are collecting letters from uh, the various groups that uh, are doing uh, important things with us. Uh, also to demonstrate our government that uh, in a way we are essential for the development of uh, this equipment. So uh, they are with us. They know that uh, we have been uh, doing a very good job in supporting uh, people and um, so basically we, we have a particular status in Italy which allows us in our supply chain to stay open regardless of, uh, of the uh, various decrees that are stopping everything else. Now uh, of course we are trying to do that uh, for a limited number of products so you may see shortage on uh, um, some of the products that uh, I didn't mention for the simple reason that, of course, we have stock. Uh, we are still manufacturing something. Uh, however, we are trying to give priority to all of those products that are in higher demand for critical uh, designs. So I'm not expecting to have huge trouble because our production capacity is, uh, is quite high. But uh, there might be, of course, uh, some, uh, some delays if uh, things, of course, continue like this. And if you go to our website, there is a COVID-19 page, which uh, is yep. uh, up to date. Uh, we keep uh, updating it every day. Uh, so we, you will see the, the current situation of the distribution network uh, of Arduino, the resellers, and our direct contacts. So if you are in the need of, uh, as Dario said, of, of a, a large quantity, for especially for, for medical reasons, uh, uh, you can reach, uh, directly reach out to us uh, because we can help you. Uh, understand uh, where to so how to source these parts uh, in the in the most reliable and the quickest way. Uh, uh, so um, I think uh, I think we are we are we are done. I don't see any 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 more any more questions. Um, 
Well, so I still invite you to, to, to come to our community channel, the forum and Discord to share your thoughts. And uh, thank you a lot, Dario. Your, thank you. Your presence was very well appreciated by our attendees. We should do this uh, quite more often. Uh, so thank you to everyone. And uh, let's continue talking because uh, the emergency response needs makers, needs engineers, needs open source hardware and software, and needs our collaboration. So this conference was our, our contribution to this worldwide collaboration. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.